Welcome everybody on Zoom, welcome everybody in the lecture hall, everybody from the future. Today we are going to spend time looking at probabilities. Sounds very scary. I hope uh, I will try manage to make it not so scary. Um, before we start, I will ask you a few clicker questions. We can take uh, a bit of time uh, for that uh, regarding term frequencies, statistics, and so on, and uh, then we'll proceed with a 101 of probabilities that I know you already know, but it's just to make sure that it's uh, on top of your mind. And uh, then we'll proceed with a brand new way of doing search. So, yes, a first question. The volume is a bit lower. Yes, that's for the microphone there. We, we can just increase the volume uh, if we use the, uh, the cube. Thank you very much. Okay, here's the first question. We saw that one way, or at least when we tried, we could have used the term frequency for the weights in the vector space model, right? In order to compute the scores. But why is it that we just don't use the term frequencies? Why is it that we did something more complicated with the, uh, the formula? Because that would be the first uh, intuition, right? To just score with the number of times that a query term appears in a document. Ah, the majority has just swapped, and now there is people changing their minds. Aha. Uh -huh. All right. Let me hold the suspense no longer and let you know this is the correct solution. Indeed, uh, you might have terms that are concentrated in just a few documents. And uh, these are actually the informative terms. But if you only focus on the term frequencies with the stop words, they will also have a high term frequency, even though it's totally useless. Uh, for example, a word like is, b, a, v, and so on. Uh, so this is why we use the inverted document frequency. And the inverted term frequency is a trap in the third one. Uh, the first one is incorrect because this is not Boolean retrieval. Uh, why is it not Boolean retrieval? the vector space model. What's the difference with Boolean retrieval? Yes. We're trying to rank. That's the first difference. And another difference? Yes, but wh why in the model? How do we model the documents in a way that we can do end with Boolean queries and not the vector space model? Um, so in the way that we relate documents and terms, we can do it as list set or bag, right? So how, how is it different, the two? Yes, Boolean is sets and vector space model is bags. Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. All right. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much for this one. Uh, here's another one. What's the term frequency? Here, I'm checking that you know what we are talking about when we use this terminology. What is the term frequency of term A in document three? the term frequency of term A. Document three is right there. One, two, four, or 11. The term frequency of A in document three. Almost everybody says one. And one with 11. Eleven or one? Well, the answer is one. Eleven would be called the collection frequency. That's the total number of times that A appears across the entire collection, which is 11. But if you only look at document three, there is only one A here, right? 
see it right there. The rest is just B and C. So only one, all right? Here's another one. I already told you. Okay, let's keep it quick. <laughs> What's the collection frequency of term A? Quick, quick, quick. Yes, all right. And the majority is right. So this is indeed 11, so the total number of times that it appears in the collection. And in fact, this was a false good idea, right? You could have done it that way. Uh, what is going on? Yes, here's another one. What is the term frequency of term A? The screen sharing on Zoom is paused. Oh, yes, it's okay. What's going on? I think the it just popped up a new window somehow. Uh, let me see if I can manage. Uh, maybe I can reopen it. Uh, was it this one? Yes. So now it should be shared again. What is the term frequency of term A? What do you say? This question doesn't make sense. Yes, exactly, it doesn't make sense. The term frequency needs a term and a document. So you got it right, too. Uh, what is the inverted document frequency of term A? And I'm assuming you we use a logarithm in base 2, not in base 10. So the inverted document frequency of term A. So you need to remember the formula for inverted document frequency. It's not just the inverse. You actually need to divide the total number of documents by the document frequency. So you need to figure out the document frequency first, and then you take the log of that. Okay, so let's see what the majority says. A lot of you say zero. A lot of you say zero. And why is it zero? Can anybody tell me why it is zero? Yes, can we maybe we should use the uh, the cube? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's on. Oh. Ah, there we go. Um, so it appears in every single document. So we have it. The A appears in every single document. So we have four over four, which is one, and then log of one is zero. Yeah, exactly. So log of four divided by four, in fact, it's everywhere. It's in all documents. So this is the uh, most uh, stop worthy term that you can ever have. So the inverted document frequency is zero and then it goes up uh, with rarity. Yeah. What's the document frequency of D? This one should be quick to figure out. The document frequency of D, one, two, three or five. Right, it should be a quick one. That's the majority says three. And indeed it is three. Why? Because it's in document uh, two, it's in document three. No, sorry, 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 sorry. It's in document two and four. It is not in document one. No, it is in, sorry. Okay, let me just take some distance. So you all agree it's in document one. You all agree it's in document two, you all agree it's in document four, I saw it, but it's not in document three, so the document frequency is three, exactly. And the inverted document frequency would be log of four divided by three, right? So two minus log three. Okay, and indeed the correct answer is three, okay? Uh, this one I already asked, you already answered. This is too early. Uh, and this one I can also ask what's, in the bag of world model, so we have the bag of world model uh, and vectors to represent document, vector space model. How do we measure the similarity of two documents? We compute the dot products, the dot product of the vectors, the determinant of the outer product of the vectors, the inverse of the dot product of the vectors, similarity as opposed to the distance, or the norm of the cross products.
Okay, we have a few answers. And a lot of you say the dot product of the vectors, and this is indeed correct. So in the vector space model, we consider that if we put these TFIDFs, remember the term frequency times inverted document frequency, uh, into vectors, then uh, we can see the, the documents as points in some vector space. And we saw that the only thing that matters is the direction from the origin. The length or how far away it is from the origin doesn't matter because that corresponds to cloning documents or summarizing documents. Um, and once you see that only the direction matters, it's natural that you use the angle in order to measure similarity. And the angle is basically obtained with the dot product in an intuitive fashion, right? Um, the determinant of the outer product of two vect of the vectors does make any sense because the, the determinant of a matrix, well, you could argue a one by one matrix also have a determinant, but doesn't make any sense really in an interesting way. Uh, the inverse of the dot product, uh, this is just totally made up. Uh, and the norm of the cross product that would actually correspond to the area, right? The area or volume uh, you can compute looking at the norm of the cross product. And the cross product is itself, can itself be seen in terms of a determinant. But anyway, what we are interested in here is the dot product of the vectors. All right, and I think I'm running out of questions that I wanted to ask you, so let's go ahead. Uh, okay. Oh, where, 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 where? Where is my window? For Zoom. Uh, Zoom is open, right? So I should have a window somewhere. I don't have a window anywhere. That is very strange. Uh, oh, it is here. All right. So I need to click on new share and then uh, here and here. Got it. Now. Okay, so who is ready for probabilities? Okay, who is scared of probabilities? It's okay to be scared. It's actually scary for me to teach that too because that's heavy math, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll manage, I'll be with you. So quick recap of what we've seen so far. So the documents, we started seeing them as uh, sets uh, so the collection is a, is a set of documents. We had Boolean queries that is zero or one, right? And then we use and not or to output a subset of the documents. And then we improved on that with uh, the vector space model by considering ranked subsets of documents, right? So uh, we computed scores, right? And the way we did that, we're using uh, the bag of world model rather than the set of world model. Today, we're going to do something incredible. We'll be able to compute scores with the set of words model. Now, you've got to ask yourself, how are we going to achieve something like that? But in fact, it is possible, as we will see, because we will assume the set of words model. But let's start with a bit of probability theory. I have many slides to just bring back to you the memories of this, which I assume you, you already covered in the, in, the, uh, in the courses in the first years of your bachelor's. Um, I want also to get the notations right, because as soon as you use random variables and condition probabilities, a lot of people mess it up. And so I want to make sure that you are on a good uh, basis. Okay. So um, probabilities in the everyday life, it's something kind of intuitive, right? You, you the, the idea of rolling a die, the idea of, uh, you know, you, you have one chance in six uh, to get a specific number in a die. It's intuitive, right? But what's interesting is how mathematicians actually model that. And everything, when you talk about probabilities, starts with an omega set. There is this huge omega set. It's the entire universe of uh, possibilities, big omega. And one element of that set, omega, that we call small omega in the notation, is an elementary event. One way to look, to look at it, and that's because I also like model logic, uh, so this is why I like to call it this way. I also like to look at this big omega as a set of possible worlds. This is all the possible worlds. And omega here, the small omega, is one possible world, right? 
So, but the mathematicians don't call it world, they call it elementary events, right? So this is planet Earth here where we are, this small omega, and all the others could be other parallel worlds where things could be different, right? Okay, and what you have once you have this that omega with uh, lots of elementary events is that you assign probabilities, right? So th there is a planet Earth on which it's raining, another one on which it's not raining, and, and so on and so on. And what you do is that you assign a number to every one of these elementary events, and it has to be all positive and sum up to one, right? Now, here it's easy because it's discrete, right? I just have a finite number of worlds and so on. Just know, even though I'm not going to go into that, that it also can be extended to the case where it's infinite, and then you have uh, theories that were invented in the 19th and 20th century with the notion of measurable space and measure and so on and so on and so on. And I'm, I'm not going to go that far. Who knows actually measurable spaces, measures and so on? Okay, some of you, okay. But don't worry, I'm staying in the finite case, finite case, discrete and so on, which is the most easy one. So we have a finite set uh, omega and we have numbers that are positive and add up to one. Okay, so far so good? Okay, now what I can consider is subsets of omega, not to be confused with the elementary events, right? The elementary events are elements. And if we consider a subset, we call it an event. An event is a subset, an elementary event is an element. So an event is a subset of omega and thus itself is a set of worlds, a set of elementary uh, elements. So what we can do is compute the partial sum of the probability weights, not on the entire omega, that would be one, but only on E. And if we do it only on E, we're going to find something between zero and one. This is the probability of the event, and we can use the same notation P. So P normally is used with the elementary events, right? So the, 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 uh, the theoretically, we should only use it on elementary events, small omega. But we allow ourselves, because the mathematician said so, to also use that on a subset and P of the subset, probability of the subset is the sum of the probabilities of the elementary events, right? So this is why I can write probability of an event, okay? Next, I can consider the complementary, the complement of the events, right? So this is just all the worlds that are not in E, right? All the elementary events that are not in E. And usually it's written with the same letter as the event, but with a small horizontal bar on top of it. It's called the complement. And the probability of the complement is one minus, right? So in that case, the probability of E was two plus 1.2, that's five. So it was 0 0.5, one half. And the probability of the complement is one minus that, which is also 0 0.5, okay? So this is the complement. Something else that actually is not always in every probability lecture that we'll use it today is the notion of odd. Now the notion of odd is something that you find in these, um, places where you can bet on sport, on uh, on uh, uh, the name of the future prince and so on and so on, right? It's quite popular in Great Britain. This is all based on odds. They, they will tell you it's one against two, one against three and so on and so on. And the way you compute the odds on, of an event is you just compute the ratio of the probability that it happens versus the probability it does not happen. So you have an odd in that case for E, one to one, right? And the odd is one one half divided by one half, right? So it's just the ratio of can happen, cannot happen. So it ranges to zero, the odds are zero if it is extremely unlikely or not even possible that it happens, all the way to infinity uh, if uh, it's almost certain to happen, okay? All right, next, because we have sets, and we know that uh, with sets, we can compute the union and the intersection not just the complements. So let's take two events then, which are two subsets of omega, and we intersect them, E intersection with F. And we see in that case, there's only one elementary event, 0 0.1, and we'd like to define the probability also of the intersection of E with F. The, oth the other thing that we can consider is the union of E and F, right? And it turns out that you can relate the two because you can say that the probability of the union is the probability of E plus the probability of F. But the problem is that you count it twice, the events, the elementary events in both. So you need to subtract to correct. It's a correction. You need to subtract once the intersection because you counted it twice. 
right? Who agrees with that formula? Okay. Uh, it's a formula that you can also see with cardinalities, right? Uh, in fact, it's a generalization of the same formula with cardinalities because cardinalities would be the uniform probability distribution, right? But in that case, it doesn't need to be uniform. Uh, so this is expressed in probabilities. All right, so this is a generic formula. It always works, whatever the, uh, the, the, the E and F are going to be. Okay, now there are interesting cases in real life. A first interesting case is the case of disjoint events. Um, a disjoint event, for example, is event E, there is a snowstorm, Event F, there is a heat wave. I think you will agree that these are disjoint, right? You're not going to get a snowstorm at the same time you get a heat wave. So this is a special case where E and F do not intersect. What it means is there exists no world in which there is both at the same location a snowstorm and a heat wave. What happens in that case is the probability of the intersection is zero. And that means you can rewrite the formula of before, the ones with you add the two and then subtract the correction. There is no correction anymore because there is no intersection. So the way you know that two events are disjoint is the probability of the union is the sum directly of the two probabilities. So the probability that there is a snowstorm or a heat wave is the sum of the probability that there is a snowstorm and the probability there is a heat wave. Okay, everybody's following? Okay, you should already know that, right? I'm just refreshing things you should already know. Next, there is an interesting formula called the partition rule, which is if you want to partition an event E according to another event F, you divide E into two parts. There is a part of E where F happens. You can say an event happens, by the way, if it contains the world in which you are. So there is the part of E where F happens. And there is a part of E where F does not happen. It turns out that they are disjoint, right? E intersection F and E intersection, the complement of F, they are, they are disjoint. You cannot be both in F and not in F, right? So because they are disjoint and their union is E, then you can write E as the union of E F and E not F, all right? That's called the partition rule. Uh, all right, here's an interesting one. And this is where things actually start to get serious. Um, you can consider conditional probabilities. For example, it's the, co the condition that there are clouds in the sky, given that there is a heat wave. That could be a conditional probability. How do you define it? Well, first you have this vertical bar that you use in order to denote it. So this is here the probability that event E is happening, knowing that F is happening. Uh, and this is obtained by renormalizing, basically the probability of E, but you need to renormalize that on just F, right? So you need to ignore what's outside F. So it means that you need to compute the probability that F happens given E, so the, that's the intersection of the two, divided, renormalized with the probability of F, right? And you can see it's again between zero and one, right? Uh, if the intersection is empty, then the conditional probability will be zero. And if the intersection is the entire F, then uh, you're gonna get one, okay? So this is a conditional probability with a vertical bar. Note that E and F are events. Right? I haven't talked about random variables yet. Right? So these are events. Either an event happens or doesn't happen. Right? It's the probability that E happens given that F happens. OK. Now I can rewrite that formula. It's just the same formula written in a different way that I can take the intersection as the product of the probability of F and the probability of E given F. Right? It's exactly the same formula. This is called the chain rule. The idea is that. If you want to compute the probability that both E and F happen, you start with the probability that F happens, and then you add E. How do you do that? You basically assume F, so now it's the probability of E conditioned on F, right? because you already have assumed that F happens on the right. And that's called the chain rule. So the probability, for example, that there is um, a snowstorm, is the probability that there are clouds in the sky multiplied by the conditional probability that the temperature is, um, let's say, around zero given that there are clouds in the sky. 
multiplied with the probability that there is high wind, knowing that the temperature is low and that there are uh, clouds in the sky and so on. So the chain rule here, it's only a level of two with E and F, but you can continue at will with many, many events, right? You can do the probability of E, F, G, then you would need to multiply with the probability of G knowing E and F, right? And then you can take it from there. This is the chain rule. For whom is it intuitive? Okay. Now, here's another thing that another property that events can have. There's these joints that we've already seen. This is independent. Do not confuse this joint and independence. It's not the same. This joint means the intersection is empty. Independent is something else. Independent means that the conditional probability of E on F does not depend on F. It's just the same as, uh, as the probability of E, right? You don't care about F. In that case, you say that the events are independent. And if you rewrite the formula that we had right here, uh, which one was it? Uh, yes, exactly. If you rewrite that formula now, knowing that the probability of E given F is the same as probability of E, you can replace that. And then you see the probability of the intersection is the product of the probabilities, right? So E and F probability is the product. Okay. For example, what could I say as an example? Um, um, the probability uh, that there is a snowstorm and that there will be an exam for information retrieval is the same as the probability there is a snowstorm times the probability there will be an exam for information retrieval. In practice, it might not be true because you could cancel it because of a snowstorm. But just as an example, that it's some things that have absolutely nothing to do with each other then you can just uh, you can just multiply. Let me give you another example. Just I realize the snowstorm and the, the exam is not a good idea. You have two dice that you both roll independently. I roll one and Marco rolls the other one. The probability that I get six and six is the probability one six that I get a six times the probability that Marco gets a six, right? So you multiply this because the two dice are completely independent from each other. That's an example. So you see, this joint means the probability of the union is the sum of the probabilities. Independent means the probability of the intersection is the product of the probabilities, right? So you can remember them side by side, but it's not the same thing. Okay, so this is independent. And now here's a puzzle, and you probably saw them many, many, many times, and there will be other puzzles in the exercise session, and, uh, and uh, um, I think it's the Monty Hall problem in the exercise session that will be discussed. There is another one with the uh, Luxembourger Lee uh, that I might tell you next week. But anyway, here's one. When it rains, I forget my umbrella 5% of the time. I also know that it rains every other day. Right? And last year, so it means half of the days, last year I had my umbrella, it's statistics, on 271 days. I had my umbrella. So you can basically get the likelihood uh, that I have my umbrella on a specific day. Another question is, I have my umbrella today. Do I? I think I do. Okay. Here it is. I have my umbrella. Don't look outside. Is it raining? So how would you solve that? Anybody on Zoom, maybe? I will tell you otherwise, don't worry, but if anybody has any idea. Nobody? So we kind of want to compute a conditional probability here, right? We want to know the probability that it's raining given that I have my umbrella, right? So visually, let's look at it that way. We have two events, the event that I have my umbrella and the event that it's raining. And what happens is we can compute the conditional probability of me having my umbrella given that it's raining. That's 95%. Remember, I told you I forget it 5% of the times when it's raining. And then there is the uh, swapped uh, conditional probability where you compute the probability that it's raining given that I have my umbrella. And the problem is that it's the other way around, right? So the probability I don't forget my umbrella if it rains, this one we know, but if we swap it, this one I don't know. So how do I get this one from this one? That's basically the, uh, the problem. How do you swap things? Um, 
And the trick is to look at the probability that it's both raining and I have my umbrella. It's the probability of the intersection of the events. And you can write it in two ways using the chain rule. Remember the chain rule? The chain rule was this one here, uh, this one, right? That's the chain rule. But you know that E intersection F is symmetric, right? There is no order between E and F. But the way that I use the chain rule, I started with F and then uh, conditioned E on F, but I can do the opposite too. I can also take the probability of E and then take F condition on E, right? So I can do it in two ways. So let's do it in two ways then. These are the two ways I can do it, right? These are the two ways I can write my chain rule. Now let's forget about the probability of the intersection and just look at line two and line three, right? We have twice a product and they are the same. Now I can rewrite that. What did I do here? I'm just moving around the probability of the umbrella. So this, uh, this, this thing here, I'm just dividing everywhere by it, right? And this is why then I get it at the bottom right there, right? This is called the base formula. Who already saw it? I assume many of you, very famous. And Bayesian networks and the whole, there's a whole universe of science dealing with this formula. So it's a magic trick in order to turn the prob conditional probability into the same bat swaps. Right? This is what it does. It's extremely powerful because very often you have a conditional probability that is very easy to estimate. And if you swap it, it's extremely hard. In fact, it's so hard that it might even be even hard to make sense of it, right? Um, for example, intelligent life in the, in the universe, the probability that there are aliens, that there are other civilizations in the universe, how do you even estimate that? It's very hard. But if you start swapping the, the, the probabilities and conditioning on the other hand, if there are alien civilizations, what are the odds that we actually can spot something? This is kind of the thinking. So the base formula is very powerful because it allows you to estimate likelihoods of events that we have absolutely no idea about, you cannot even quantify them. But somehow, if you reverse and swap the conditional probability, then it makes it easier to actually do the reasoning, right? Okay, so this is the, ba the base formula. And again, it's a magic trick to, to just turn a conditional probability into the one where you swapped the size. Okay, and now it's actually easy because now it's almost trivial to solve the problem. You just replace the three uh, numbers because it turns out that the three probabilities, we know them from the, from the slide. If you, let me show it again. These are exactly these three lines here that give us the three, the three numbers. And the question is the results. So we just put the probability that I have my umbrella knowing that it's raining is 95%. So you know 95% is the same as 0, 95. The probability that it's raining is one half every other day, right? And the probability that I have my umbrella, this is 271 days. I counted last year, 271 days out of 365. There you go. And you find 65%. Now, this is incredible. Now, I'm able to say the probability or the likelihood that it's actually raining outside is 64%. And the thing that is magic that happened is that if I remove that, put it back here, don't see it. What's the probability it's raining? One half percent. The moment, take my umbrella out of my bag and show it to you, that changes to 64%. This is the, this is the magic. And the idea is that there is the notion of prior and posterior, that the prior probability was 0 0.5 and then there is an update that I'm showing you the umbrella, and then we have an updated probability, right? So this is actually relates it to information theory, right? The idea that you have new information coming in, and when you have new information coming in, then you can update the uh, likelihoods or the estimates that something is happening. Okay. So the visual representation, again, I had my umbrella here, 271 out of the entire year. I only forget it 5%. So we know this and this. We also know it's raining 50% of the time. And this is where we get the 65%. So you see how we, this magic thing about jumping from 50 to 64, this is how it happens. It happens in this way. It's just because I give you additional information that you can exclude all of the worlds that are in the gray zone. And suddenly the ratio of the, the raining, not raining uh, is actually higher. 
Okay, so again, the prior was one half before I took my umbrella out of my bag and it becomes updated by the new information that now I have my umbrella to a posterior probability and that's basically the, the magic of it, all right? So this is Bayes' rule. It's extremely important. In fact, it's so important that we can actually derive an entire search engine system out of it, as we will shortly see. Okay. So that's it for the base formula. Who now is comfortable with it? Understood what went on? Okay, very good. Now I'm moving on to something else we'll need for our information retrieval system. And that something else is called a random variable. Now, random variables are tricky. They are tricky because they are not variables and they are not random. That's the problem with random variables. So do, just accept it. It's neither random nor is it a variable. What is a random variable? It's actually a function. It's a function that maps the omega space to some target set. For example, I can have a green triangle and a red pentagon and a blue square. So my target set has three elements and I'm just mapping every elementary event to one element in my target set. There is no randomness. It is deterministic. This mapping is deterministic. For every elementary event, there is one, exactly one element of the target set in there. I put them in there. Uh, so again, a random variable is a function from omega to anything, target set. So this is why I call that big X. Big X is a function that takes omega, it takes a small omega and returns the value in S. Okay, this is it, right? So mapping from here to there. Now, what can we do once we have a function like that? We can do something that mathematicians love to do. You basically have defined a measure, so the probability distribution in omega, and you can magically transfer the probability distribution from omega to S. Just because you have a mapping from omega to S, with that mapping, you can take the probability distribution with you to S. So it means that once we have that, we can define some probability distribution on the set S by adding the weights. For example, if I compute the probability of the blue square, I'm just looking at all the elementary events that are associated with the blue square. There's two of them, 0.2 and 0.2. So the probability of the blue square is 0.4, exactly. The probability of the green triangle is 0.5. Yes, I add the two and the probability of the pentagon is 0.1. So you see that I can derive a probability distribution on my target set on S that is now defined no longer on the elementary events, but it's now defined on my shapes, right? Every shape has a probability. What's important is that that probability is not P. P is defined on the elementary events. So I add a subscript here to say it's not the same. This is something different. It's a totally different mathematical animal, right? So PX is a distribution on S, right? So PX takes a value in S and gives me a number between zero and one. So you, you, by now you see what's happening. My random variable is a function, but the reason it's called a random variable is that I can actually transfer the probability distribution on the, on the set of the values that it can take, right? So what I can then write is the probability px of the square is 0 0.4, px of the pentagon is 0 0.1, and px of the triangle is 0 0.4. There is another notation that people like, which is this one, right? That's totally fine to, instead of writing PX like this, so here you would have the, the actual probability distribution transferred to S, but you can equivalently write it in terms of events. Because if you consider the set of the elementary events that are associated with the blue square, it is an event, it's a subset of omega, right? the subset of omega that has the elementary events that are mapped to the blue square. That event is denoted x equal blue square. It's only a notation because again, x is a function, but the notation x equals blue square designates an event. And that's the events that x of omega is equal to the blue square. All right, so you can write it this way, this way, you choose. 
I'm fine with both. Actually, I prefer this one for pedagogical reasons, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to be using this one for information retrieval, but equivalently, you can do this. However, what you cannot do is this. You cannot write P of the blue square. That is mathematically not making any sense because P is defined on omega, takes elementary events, can also take events. The blue square is not an event. X equals the blue square is an event, but the blue square is not an event. So that you cannot do. And the, the problem, the reason why it's problematic is that many people do it, including in the book, the, the, information, the information retrieval book, they do exactly this. Of course, if you have a PhD in statistics and you're a professor and so on, then of course you can do this because you know what you're doing, right? I think it's a very bad idea to teach it in that way because that's very confusing when you start writing things like that. Nobody knows anymore what you're talking about. When you have multiple random variables, imagine that I have X and Y now as random variables and both X and Y can take shapes. Now, if I write probability of the blue square, how do I know if it's X or Y? I have no idea if it's X or Y. I don't know, but this way I know. I'm explicitly writing it's X or Y. So I'm gonna be very careful in this lecture. I will stick to this convention here to make it very clear. And uh, you should not do that. Of course, once you have your master's in computer science, you can do that. Nobody will check anymore, but I strongly recommend you don't ever do that until the end of your studies. Okay. So we'll have a few minutes before the break. Now, we can also compute given two random variables, X and Y. We can compute joint probabilities. So if I have a specific value that uh, my big X can take, which is small X, it's conventional to use the uppercase, lowercase. And I, I compute that both big X equals small X and big Y equals small I, small Y. So it's the joint probability then I look for all my worlds in which it's both true that big X is small X and that big Y is small Y. For example, if I want to uh, big X to be a blue square and big Y to be a green rectangle, then I'm looking at all of the worlds so that big X of the world is a blue square and big Y of the world is a green rectangle. And I sum on them, right? This is actually yet another event, okay? So this is called the joint probability, right? And the joint probability, can be used in turn to define the conditional probability. What's important here compared to before is that before we had looked at the intersection of two, of two events and we had looked at the condition on uh, an event condition on another event, right? Now I'm doing it with random variables, right? So here it's X and Y, which is a joint probability distribution. And now I have X conditioned on Y and this I obtained by dividing the intersection, the fact that both uh, big X is small X and big Y is small I, small Y, knowing that big Y is small Y. Now, this one might be a bit confusing to write or, you know, because you have all these subscripts. This is why I prefer to write it that way. This is the same. This is strictly equivalent. It's just a different notation, but this might be a bit easier to understand, right? Because here you're explicitly saying, What's the probability that big X is small X and big Y is small Y, uh, given that big Y is small Y? Okay, okay let, let me just do a quick poll. Who finds it more complex here and easier here? Okay, for whom is it the opposite? Who understands this better? Usually DC. Yes, some of you. Okay, yeah. It's totally fine. Both are actually acceptable, right? All right. Um, and mind the notation here, this is as mathematical or rigorous as it can be, because you can see that this PXY here, this is a probability distribution on pairs of values, right? You have one value for small x and one value small y, and whatever pair you have, you can compute with this function, the probability of the, 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 the joint probability that these are the values you get with big X and big Y. Here, it also takes two values, small X and small Y, but it doesn't compute the same thing. Here it computes the conditional that you have small X given that you have small Y, right? And it is mathematically rigorous because this is unambiguous. This function is unambiguous probability distribution. And this is also unambiguous, right? So this is as formal and precise 
as it can be, right? But again, I will prefer that. In the rest of the course, I would write things that way. It's very intuitive, actually, because again, big X equals small X, that's an event, right? It's the events that in the particular world that I'm watching, I get this value for the random variable X. So again, big X is a random variable. X is a particular value. X, I can replace that with the blue square, with the green triangle, with whatever I want. The big X and the small, the, the small X and the small Y, they are just classical variables in mathematics, programming variables, if you want, in, in Java or Python, right? Who understands the difference? Again, between big X and big Y, these are random variables. These are mappings from the probability space omega to some target set. And the small ones here, I'm using the notation, these are actual mathematical variables. Who gets the difference? Okay. And I'm gonna, just before the break, I know I'm insisting, do not ever, 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 ever write something like that. This is absolutely a disaster. Who, I mean, of course you see the intent, right? The intent was obviously that you wanted to compute the probability that big X equals small X, knowing that big Y equals small Y. But the problem is that only a human can actually make sense of that. If you feed that into a computer, a computer will not make any sense of that. And the reason is that the, in these formulas, you're not even, there's no random variables in there. Technically, these are mathematical variables, right? X and Y. So I can replace them with anything I want, for example, with numbers. So what's the probability of one given two? The probability of one given two doesn't mean anything, right? However, the probability that big X equals one, knowing that big Y equals two, that makes sense. So never do that, right? And again, in the textbook, they are doing that. So you need to do the mental gym or actually automatically replacing with this, this way of looking at things. Um, I mean, whenever I see papers or books that do that, I find it very scary because I know it's going to be a nightmare to actually figure out what's going on because it's, it's just uh, exploding in my brain. Uh, so I, I really recommend if you ever see that, just don't be surprised if this is tough, try to rewrite it in this way and that actually might make more sense. Okay, who understands why this is not good? Okay, very good, then I did, I did my job. You deserve your break. And after the break, we'll continue and then I move on to a, an actual information retrieval system. So I'll see you at quarter past, uh, no, sorry, I, I had two minutes, so 17 past 11, so that you have your entire break. So see you in a bit.